Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis, the web's talk show about Gnosticism, the ancient Gnostics, Gnosis, and all the surprising places that Gnosticism and Gnostic themes can show up. Uh, this is the latest entry in our bonus series, The Black Iron Prison, where we talk to people who aren't necessarily scholars of Gnosticism, who aren't necessarily uh, modern Gnostic practitioners, about their body of work uh, to discover some of the interesting places that Gnostic themes may arrive in these people's work. And uh, tonight, very exciting show. I often say we're honored uh, to have a guest. I often say I'm excited. And that's true. I, I swear I haven't been lying to you all in the past. Uh, but this show is particularly special. We're talking to the person who, you know, and, and I'm sure uh, they hear this a lot, uh, but who probably literally saved my life. <laughs> so we have uh, the musical genius, uh, Zola Jesus. Uh, Nika uh, Danilova, uh, thanks so much for being here. Hello. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. And, oh my God, it's uh, it's it's an extreme pleasure to have you uh, throughout much of the last decade, but particularly in the the early part of the decade. I was in a really dark place. I was stuck at a a really bad job, but fortunately, it was an office job. I got to have the headphones, and uh, you know, your your albums probably literally uh, again saved me. So, if uh, people out there like this show, uh, thank Nika. Oh, well, thank you. I'm glad I could be a, a good part of those horrible years. <laughs> yes. Um, now, uh, there's obviously so much we want to talk to you about, but before we can transcend, before we can ascend, before we can break through to that wonderful enlightenment, first comes the icky, gross, material, low stuff that I hate, but we are brought to you by viewers and listeners like you. We are financially supported by, uh, I, don't, I don't want to call you fans, by the Gnostic elite. Uh, and if you want to help contribute to us spreading the light of Gnosis, to being able to do this show, please do so by going to patreon.com slash Gnostic, and you can sign up for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. And uh, you can also put a cap on that if you're scared uh, you have a budget and you don't want us to put out a thousand pieces of media. And you can also do one-time donations at paypal.com slash Gnostic. And uh, if you can't help us out financially, we completely understand. Uh, it's, it's strange times and it's going to be strange times forever. You can also help us out by telling people about the show, sharing it on your social media, uh, the liking and subscribing on YouTube, leaving good reviews on the podcatcher of your choice, particularly um, Apple Podcasts. Uh, so, so please give us some some five stars and hype us up. Uh, just take your favorite episode and send it to a friend. Uh, you know, the, the the mouth to ear, person to person, still really works. So take this episode and <laughs> send it to a friend. Oh my God! Okay, we're done. We can actually get into the good stuff. Uh, Nika, does Gnosticism and, and the Gnostic mythos appeal to you in, in some way, in any way at all? Actually, it's funny, funny you should ask, because I have been starting to get to get into Gnosticism uh, more recently than not, actually, over the past two years. Um, I've taken more of an interest in uh, the Gospels. <laughs> but I'm not very um, not very well versed in them. But I, I like the idea that uh, that maybe the the world was a mistake <laughs> because that's how I feel. So um, that aspect of Gnosticism really resonates with me. The uh, the sort of imperfected form of humanity and the the shame of that. Yeah, precisely. And I, I think that a lot of people come to Gnosticism uh, already sort of having an appreciation for these these themes, already thinking that, already noticing that. And because it is, uh, you know, I'm part of a, of a revivalist mo uh, movement in many ways, right? Uh, modern Gnosticism uh, does have uh, some sort of breaks in its heritage in, in many ways. So, uh, you know, most of us who come to it as practitioners, uh, we're converts, we're drawn by this by this stuff, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think you're, you're right, there's something really powerful uh, about, uh, without getting too depressing, about understanding the world a, as a mistake uh, and just sort of seeing that there's, there's a crack in everything and that the mistake doesn't come from us necessarily, but uh, from powers on high. Yeah. Um, with uh, uh, um, 
so talking about the just recent, relatively recent interest in Gnosticism, you know, I, I, I've heard you, you kind of talk uh, uh, about um, broader interest in, in the occult and in magic on some other podcasts. So you mentioned sort of getting into the occult over the last few years after you left, uh, you know, the big city, big cities to live close to nature in a rural area. Uh, could you talk a little bit about your history with religion and spirituality? Like, were you raised religion? And, and what do you feel appealed to you from like the occult and uh, uh, sort of these uh, magical spiritualities over the last couple of years in this, this, this new part of your life? Yeah, so um, I was raised pretty agnostic. My mother is a, a Catholic, and so she grew up Catholic and tried to imbue those, you know, the guilty pleasures of Catholicism onto me, but they didn't really take. I didn't, from a very young age, I started to question God, um, like, in totality. <laughs> like, I didn't, wasn't, I was skeptical of God by the time I was like five or six. And then, um, my dad was an atheist or is an atheist. So he was, you know, pretty welcoming of my disinterest in religion. And my mom didn't care enough to really push it either way. So I grew up pretty indifferent to religion um, and uh, probably more on the atheist side. And um, I, I was more of like a really into like rationalism and like, you know, well, what what is the empirical evidence of life and like what can be proven? and you know, I was I was more inclined to see see humans as animals and as animals as just this kind of perfunctory aspect of uh, the existence of Earth. You know, um, it's just kind of like a byproduct of Earth being uh, hospitable for a particular organism to flourish. And so, um, saying things like that sort of biologically made me disinterested in religion because it, it gave sort of a purpose to things, which I felt. I didn't feel comfortable with feeling like we have a purpose. And, um, no. but I did still grow up with a, a very magical mind and was deeply interested in um, the things that could not be sort of touched or seen necessarily or proven. I've always had this interest in the more metaphysical aspects of life, even as a child, mostly as a child, um, would really get lost in my dreams. Was really into like astral projection and travel astral travel and stuff like that um and would try to do that when i was really young um and then i kind of lost touch with you know the magical aspects of myself and leaned heavy, heavier into the more rational aspects and um but it wasn't until i went through a, a really sort of classic hero's journey uh saturn return where my whole life sort of like imploded that um i was able to kind of look at my life in a more archetypal way and um you know it and in revealing re i'm revealing myself as a jungian a fan of jung and so got really into jung who helped me sort of create a context for the changes in my life and um and in doing that i discovered the red book and it reminded me a lot of one of my favorite authors, Philip K. Dick's Exegesis, <laughs> which I had um, sort of been aware of before the Red Book, actually. And um, and in doing that, seeing it, it was kind of this aha moment where I was like, you know, getting into um, understanding, you know, just allowing that magical aspect of my youth and childhood to um, come come out again. As I moved back to the woods, I was able to sort of shake off the societal conditioning of the city life and of you know urban world and uh, by doing that reconnecting with nature allowed me to reconnect with the kind of primal aspects of myself that um were laying dormant for quite a while but uh it was very exciting to put so many different pieces together in this journey of you know discovering narcissism and realizing that so many of the the creators and artists that i admire um where I had an interest in Gnosticism as well. And so that's what led me there. Um, I still feel sort of uh, skeptical about the sort of the narratives uh, in general, the narratives of Christi Christianity in general, but um, I appreciate Gnosticism because it takes into account the like the multiplicity of bodies that we inhabit. And, um, and it just feels more holistically minded than um, other sort of paths which uh, seem much more based on um, dogma and less on sort of like the personal inner gnosis that uh, that I felt like I knew from a young age 
um, as we all do, you know, but I'm, we get sort of conditioned over time to ignore those those voices within us that tell us that there's something more deeper that we just don't understand or we haven't been taught. Um, and so that's where I, that's how I got to narcissism. And, uh, and that's where I am now. Yeah, yeah, amazing. <laughs> well, the, the, the red the book, book and the exegesis, the those, those are the are two great gospels of the 20th century, right? Those, those are the Gnostic gospels of uh, of modern times. And of course, now we're in the 21st century, it'll be exciting to see, you know, what the uh, what the next what the next uh, Gnostic Gospels uh, will be and what forms they'll present themselves in, you know, and of course, I would argue that some of Zola Jesus's uh, uh, music uh, can definitely go into the, the Gnostic canon. So we'll bury that in, in a wow. desert for future generations to to discover. Okay. But uh, yeah, and, and that that uh, you, you you touched on the finding out some of the artists were influenced by it. You know that really blew my mind and drew me to Gnosticism when I was on my own journey. And you know, as a kid, I loved uh, very similar, and this is very similar for a lot of a lot of people interested in Gnosticism, right? You know, as a teen, I was loved Philip K. Dick, couldn't get enough, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, later on in life, oh, I was just completely intrigued by Jung. And then finding out, oh, okay, these these two are drinking the same water, coming from yeah. the same sources, and it's you know. It's it's a living stream. It's it's a river that still flows. Um, but uh, coming back to to the art, uh, there does seem to be something particularly of Gnosticism and art. And you, we spend a lot of time in the show trying to figure out all the dimensions of that, and sometimes discovering uh, new facets of this relationship between the gnosis and between the art. But I know even, even, you know, non-esoteric authors and creators and writers and musicians and, you know, people who wouldn't call themselves Gnostics, uh, are often inspired by Gnosticism. Um, totally. I, mean, I was you know, inspired by Gnosticism before I even realized it. Like I have a song called Seeker that I, and I just now am I looking back and going, wow, all of these, the themes in my life kind of led me to an interest in narcissism as it does for so many people. But, you know, we're, again, it's, there's, there's only so many water sources, as you say. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's really funny. And uh, because my next question, uh, I actually uh, mentioned Seeker. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and this is it. Uh, the ancient Gnostic said, to ascend, we must first descend. To ascend, we must first descend. And, and I feel your work, it's extremely Gnostic in that it really plums the depths of darkness and it finds something deep, like even beautiful uh, in that darkness. And and let me know if this is a read-in. So I write out my questions beforehand. <laughs> so let me know if this is a read-in. But like on songs like Seeker and Soak, there's the idea of knowing that there's this myriad of forces, these archonic and demiurgic internal and external forces that, that trap us. And we're actually aware of this oppression, but within it, we can find the transcendence. Like, would you say that kind of both personally and artistically, you've discovered something in these shadow places, you know, these shadow places that we normally want to avoid and henceforth cut ourselves off from these discoveries? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm always been very fascinated by the darkness because it's nothing but a mirror of the light. And so if you understand the dark, then you understand the light. And sometimes, you know, you need to plunge to the depths and sort of meet those demons in order to see, you know, the the beauty and divinity and everything. And, and um, so I definitely believe that it's and it's also like the chiaroscuro the term of the the light and the dark you know holding both simultaneously but i think it's just as important to give the give space and credence and and um and to honor the darkness because the only thing sometimes i feel like the only thing that's negative about uh, about darker things is our fear uh with sort of confronting them and fear is something that can be confronted itself and so you know once you confront the fear of the darkness you confront the darkness and um and that's really transcendental yeah. for me at least <laughs> uh yeah i i i completely 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 agree um and i i think there is also you really have to have a a courage to, to go to these places, right? Which, which you know, you obviously do as as a creator. Uh, and um, but the, the talking about creating and, and inspiration with this 
you know, blossoming interest of the last couple of years, even though you, you look back and discover these these themes, you know, like Philip K. Dick and actually Jung both did, right? They went back and examined their early work and were mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, I was, I was, these are Gnostic texts and I didn't know when I was creating them. Um, but but uh, with, with this relatively recent focus of the last few years, uh, have like anything, you know, reading the Red Book, um, meditation, rituals, active imagination, visionary work, uh, you know, sort of practical occultism. Have you done any of these practices to to create music, to, to get inspired? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, once I started to, well, I've been practicing meditation for uh, about 10 years now. I started with transcendental meditation. But before that, of course, when I was a kid, I was meditating, but didn't realize it when I was trying to, you know, reach the astral plane or whatever. But um, seriously, meditating for the past 10 years has been really helpful for me to kind of discover the, uh, just how, what exists and what happens when you shut everything else down, because I'm a very, uh, uh, I, my nervous system is kind of on, um, it's always on max. So to really quiet it down and go, wow, there's a, an entire universe of feeling and of, of existence and, you know, things can really sort of blossom when, when you allow your mind to just take a back seat for a little bit and chill out. Um, and that's kind of how I started discovering active imagination. And then through there, got really excited to discover uh, the potential of visionary magic, which is my favorite sort of form of... Uh, magic that I would practice because it's something that uses um, my faculties, which have been sort of useless up until now. <laughs> my imagination and my ability to like uh, just kind of go in my dreams and and um, kind of fish around for things. So that was really exciting um, because I'm not so good with rituals and I'm not really good with uh, you know learning all of the the spells or, you know, wearing the robes, like, you know, being really, really like seducing the spirits. Like, I'm not very good at that. Um, but I am good at, at letting my mind uh, find them in, in some other space. So that's been, that's been really exciting. But then also just like getting, using that as well as a, as a means of sort of divining um, pathways for my creative ventures and, um, it helps me kind of, it tells me where to go next sometimes. So I appreciate that. But you really have to be listening. And it is a really a practice. So I'll, I'll get out of practice for a while and then feel like it's not as easy for me to access those, those sort of sacred spots. And so then I have to kind of like get back in shape. So it's, it's a lot of work, you know, it's, that stuff is hard work, but it really, the more that I uh, practice regularly and embrace those aspects of my life and my, my inner and outer life, the more deeply connected I feel to the world and the more I can feel everything sort of talking. You know, everything starts to talk to you when you're listening for it, but you've got to be listening. Yes, precisely, and uh, I mean, I mean that that goes for the, the, the having to practice and stay in practice. It's just like anything you want to commit yourself to in life, right? But uh, I, I find particularly with, with any of this visionary work, um, and, and it, I think it has to do with, with the capacity for imagination. And, and of course, when I say imagination, some people are like, "Oh, you don't think it's real?" Well, no, <laughs> I think it's very real. I think yeah. uh, I, I haven't quite a, again squared the circle or or figured. It out, but but somehow I believe that our capacity for imagination is what connects us to these these other dimensions, these realms, these entities, our inner divinity. You know, this this is the bridge, and it, it does play a role uh, when we're doing this this act of imagination work with this visionary work. Uh, even though I I don't necessarily think that it's it is all in our heads, uh, but particularly for visionary work, uh, it's been my experience and my experience talking to others and you know people who perhaps do uh, active visualizations in their meditation work that the practice really does seem to make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think for anybody watching or listening, they can really sort of perhaps 
when you talk about visionary work, really make the connection between spirituality, Gnosticism, uh, the occult, and imagination and creativity. But do, do you think in a broader sense that there's sort of a, a connection between magic and creativity and, and uh, the occult and uh, um, uh, this capacity that we have for using the imagination? Definitely. I think they're they're kind of I don't want to say they're the same thing, but I think that they're very close to the same thing or very inter sort of interrelated. Um, and I don't necessarily know how, but I know that when I am truly in a creative flow state, it is very similar to the feelings that I'm having when I'm, you know, doing like visionary stuff or whatever. It's 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 a, it's the same. It feels like the same muscles are being used, and that's probably why you know in my music these themes come out that also come out in my in my magical personal practice because it's the same well, you know, I'm kind of dip, and, and that's why I think also having a discipline in terms of meditation or, or magic or something so important for creativity because you're um, nourishing that well. And instead of just pulling from it, you're also putting a lot in there. And, um, and I think that's super important. And uh, as I've been doing it, I find myself more creative than ever because I'm not thinking of, I'm not creating with my mind. I'm creating with something else. And um, it's really easy to let your mind take over these days and to let everything, you know, become a decision instead of just letting it come out like divination, which is how I prefer to see making music. It's more like divining for something that can come through you. And if you have, if you have, you know, your skills, to release that and to let it give it a space and give it a name and give it sound, then um, then it chooses you to come through. But you need to be there and you need to be ready and you know you need to be you need to again like I said you need to just be listening for it. Yes, exactly. And, and without taking away from you know the genius of many great creators, many you know many of the great artists that that I admire talk about the act of creation as almost channeling. Right. You know, and I know specifically, you know, specifically Philip K. Dick, but, you know, one of my favorite poets, uh, Milton Acorn. Right. He, he said, I, I didn't. Well, he actually said, I don't even know if I write my poems <laughs> like I, they just they just flow through me. But it, it does. Uh, and for people who have had this this flow, uh, it, it does literally feel magical. Yeah. <laughs> for yeah. any, you know, for, for the creators out there, like they'll, they'll know the feeling very well. Yeah, um, and you, know the difference. you know, the difference when like I've made songs that 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 came from that space and i've made songs that have come from my mind space and you know the difference so <laughs> yeah it's yeah. palpable <laughs> uh precisely so uh it, it does seem that within the last uh who actually i want to say i almost said a couple of years but it, it now seems to be sustained there seems to be a bit of bit of an occult revival and, and a bit of a gnostic revival um and why do you think the occult has seen a resurgence in popularity well, I think we're living in really uh, spiritually bankrupt times and religion has become um, discouraged, I think, be because we're living in such like a sort of scientific era where everything has to be sort of, you know, proven empirically and there needs to be evidence, there needs to be tangible physical uh, stuff that tells us why we're here and what we should believe. And also we're living in, in, in an era where um, consumerism and capitalism are dictating kind of our fundamental beliefs about life and about our purpose in life. And those things are so, again, spiritually bankrupt that they are driving people to feel extremely, um, I think, uh, hungry, thirsty, you know, they're, they're, they're dehydrated because they're missing an aspect of life that it used to be so deeply nourishing. Um, and that's at least what has been drawing me towards, I think, more esoteric studies uh, after some time is just feeling so uh, unfulfilled with the the world at large and the society that I have to participate in as a musician. Um, and there are so many things that I'm I'm hungry for that I'm not getting, and I don't know why. So I'm seeking seeking on my own. And I think that that's also what maybe other people are being driven to do is to find their own answers and to find their own sense of belonging. And this is kind of 
the first time I think in a in a very long time that people get to choose what they believe and um, that's exciting but it's also sort of strange and awkward because religion isn't necessarily used to being chosen it's just used to being sort of thrust upon you um, based on your cultural sort of uh, birth or whatever so it's just a very strange so I think there's a lot of people you know a lot of like cult religions and a lot of um, Instagram religions and stuff like that that are preying on people's desire or need for community and belonging and answers and purpose in life um, and I hope that they find it in the right places and I hope we all find it in the right places really but it is a very, very strange time to be alive right now. I think about it every single day. <laughs> the strangeness of, of being alive and the strangeness of having to participate in a in, um, uh, civilization that is uh, it seems really missing a lot of parts. There's a lot of voids in this, in this space that we're a part of. And... Um, it makes life kind of awkward and uncomfortable. <laughs> so I think that we really need to do our due diligence of kind of bringing back balance to the world and, and allowing people to have a spiritual and emotional life that have nothing to do with their physical bodies. Yeah, precisely. Um, well, well, talking about the world that we live in, this is sort of an awkward bridge because I know eventually somebody in, in the comments, somebody will clue in that I just want an excuse to talk about Twitter bullshit, but that, that's, not, uh, <laughs> that's not 100% true. I, I believe that the sincere impulse towards criticism is, is both necessary and in many ways is Gnostic, right? Where, you know, the, 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 the Gnostics are, are the supreme critics you know they're being critical about this fake world we live in they're being critical about god right you, you can't get much more critical um but at the same time we live in a very divided world where people are constantly uh hurling insults uh online you know tearing each other down so to kind of square the square the circle on on this which is um so like fourth rate blogs that have to pump out content uh, will get at least a few posts if you say something uh, cutting and true on Twitter, okay? So, you know, hypothetically, perhaps, uh, the, 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 a tweet that is both uh, funny, accurate, and uh, involved with, uh, with a mega superstar. So this has never I, happened to me. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> But you know, when I when I see a tweet like that, hypothetically from you, um, the uh, you know I I'm like you know yeah right like this is we we really do need to have all of our critical faculties engaged just to survive in this world. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess what I'm asking is you know what what do you think about being critical? What do you think about the importance of criticism? And and can you help me sort of? Uh, and, and I know now I'm asking you like you're you're a guru. <laughs> Um, but how we square this circle about how we do need to be critical, but everything is so negative right now. Yeah, I was actually just talking about this with someone because they're just like, um, there's someone that, a friend of mine who posts on Twitter, you know, like, like we all do, you know, maybe a bit of a shit poster, but you know, what, what else are you going to do in this economy? Yeah. Um, and someone just out of the blue with a, a much larger following started attacking him and attacking his family and out of nowhere and um that i felt was very it, it made me realize kind of people's states of mind right now and i know i've been here uh it's very low-minded and it it i feel like it reveals our uh abundance and also displacement of energy that we have and our inability to properly direct our anger at the world and at our like lack of um uh, again like nourishment so we take it out on these people we take out all these microaggressions on each other because we're unhappy with ourselves and our life and we're bored and you know we're 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 all just kind of operating at the lowest lowest level and that's what social media does because it rewards controversy and and i have great resentment for that because yeah i do tend to um speak emotionally sometimes about things when i feel so compelled um and it always comes to bite me because i always realize that i'm coming from a place that is um 
for me, it's it feels like I'm it's a low blow. I'm taking a low blow. Uh, but it, what it does is it is it ricochets off into the public and and resonates because people like it. They're attracted to anger. They're attract, and I am too. As a as a, yet another person using Twitter, you know, I get very worked up just reading something or looking at it, and then I want to you know, participate in changing my feelings. So I tweet, you know, and I think that tweeting is going to do something, whether it's going to change the problem I'm tweeting about, or it's going to change the problem I'm not tweeting about, but I'm tweeting at them just because I'm pissed off today. Whatever it is, it it is a uh, Twitter and social media is kind of like this. Um, it's this it's this space for people to feel like they have control over their lives or control over circumstances that they otherwise don't and um, because they can respond to everything they can criticize it you know and instead of people responding to things to um, give praise or to give support we'd much rather do things that don't make us vulnerable and what what does not make us vulnerable is criticizing people because then we're able to go no you're doing this wrong you're wrong i'm right you know it it's the the power dynamic is switched when you're criticizing people i've been there you know like i'm a i'm an emotional human being and i know that i've spoken out of turn in times that i feel ashamed of you know but um i think we all do it because we think that we're actually getting something done but we're really not we're just venting our frustrations into the great void and hoping it will change something even though it changes nothing it just makes you look like an asshole so that's what i learned about that but um that does not stop me from being angry <laughs> <laughs> well that that leads to the next question of uh of what i see as one of the most powerful gnostic themes and the one that that, that many creators like, which is, we seem to be enmeshed in just layers of fake realities. And cyberspace and, you know, Twitter BS and social media BS seems to be, you know, one of those realities. Mm -hmm. um, but so is political narratives. So are lots of things we seem to be tangled up in our day-to-day -day life. So I guess for, for some of these very material feeling fake realities like cyberspace, like political narratives, do you know some way that we can get out? And I guess it's a two-part question. You know, the second part is there seems to just be layers of fake reality after fake reality. Is there a real reality underneath it all? Awesome question. I don't know. I think it is. I mean, there. what is reality, really? But... Yeah. Um, that is a strange thing that we're, we're, we're participating in a great experiment right now, the experiment of the internet, because for the first time we have uh, the ability to have a separate reality that um, engages with other human beings in real time. But it is quite, you know, by definition, virtual. So does that make that it does it make it any less real if it's not happening necessarily physically or if the, you know, and this is this is something that I'm, I wonder is, but I, I think that at the end of the day, it is very real because uh, there are other people on the end of those computers or phones that are reading what you're writing and it changes their experience or their feeling of, of you or I don't know, but so that's real, I guess, you know, but again, what is real and what isn't real? Like that's, a, that's a bigger question. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, believe it or not, I, I, I don't have an answer to that one yeah. either. So, um, so I, I, I don't even want to refer to Zola Jesus as just a musical project because you've created a, an entire interlocking aesthetic for it, right? It's just Zola Jesus, a project in, in my, the, the, the creative project, in, in, the, the creation, in, in my opinion. I don't know if you agree, uh, but, um, so, so I don't want to lower uh, what you do by by calling it branding. But that that said, you know, you know, it, it's not just creators like you, you know, great musicians like you that have to brand themselves online. It, like it seems like we all have to do it, I and mean, we have to do it for our careers, and we have to do it for our interpersonal relationships. Do, do you think there's some way to be able to use the internet uh, while still being human and not being a brand? No. <laughs> yeah. I hate it. Yeah. It's like everything you have to do, you have, you know, like I've caught myself have doing that where you're thinking about yourself from the outside perspective. And that is so 
it's such a boner killer to be honest yes <laughs> It sucks because it's it, it it doesn't allow you to be in the flow. You have to constantly consider how it fits into a cultural narrative or how you fit into your communities or spaces. And um, yeah, I guess there's aspects of that that um, there's aspects of it that seem like just part of art for me, and so I enjoy that. Like I I like I like making things, and so if I can make something that uses that creative energy, then I'm into it. But if it's just about packaging something to make it sell better, that that feels like, um, that feels like, I feel like I'm manipulating people <laughs> and I don't like that feeling. Like I want them to like me for me and not because like I psychologically, like I use like psychological warfare to get them to like me because I'm like using things that are sort of, you know, like the language that they can understand. I don't, you know what I mean? Like, I do know exactly what you mean. Yes. Branding just feels like a psyop. It's like, you know, what sort of culture are you going to align yourself with? And like, blah, 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 use the right font or whatever. And it's like, man. <laughs> Precisely. I, I, you know, I, I have no follow up questions or comments or any thoughts to share because I think you summed that up perfectly. So, um, <laughs> Coming back to to spiritual experiences and, you know, you coming to uh, within the last couple of years, you know, I keep saying coming to it, but coming back to it, right? Uh, but spiritual experiences and impulses, like, they can be generated by everything from mental illness to, to drugs. Like, how do we know that we're, we're not just deluding ourselves? This is, uh, this is what I ask myself all the time, because I don't want to be living in a delusion. And I think a lot of people that you know, I think it's really easy when you start having sort of spiritual or magical experiences f for you to feel like you're um, to get this kind of crazy kind of God complex or something. And I think there's a responsibility to interesting oneself in the esoteric. Uh, there's a responsibility to be discerning and to constantly uh, check on your shadow because the shadow will take those kind of like aha moments and want to use them kind of <laughs> to, to like accentuate whatever insecurities you have. So um, it's, I, but I think it's also really important to just, just to, to listen and to understand that nothing is, it's like sometimes I'll have, I'll be prodded by my partner who's a bit of a devil's advocate with this stuff. Uh, because he doesn't really understand magic in in the tangible in a tangible way, which is you know normal and natural these days. But I think there's an aspect of it that you know you need to you need to build your own personal relationship with these practices and um, and see them kind of as much as a part of reality as everything else. But in doing that, you have to be responsible in reality just as much as you're responsible in the, uh, you know, the uh, the underworld or whatever. <laughs> so I think in doing that, you're you're you know, it's not like having access to these these practices or these ideas or concepts. It doesn't make you like uh, it doesn't make you God. It just you're just able to have the access, and you should just have you should consider that a that a privilege, the pr privilege of gnosis. Um, instead of feeling like it's making you special. Yeah. Well, staying on, on this topic, you know, after getting into these practices, we talked about connections between them and, and creativity. But, uh, you know, I'm kind of big on what's normally labeled as magic. You know, I prefer the, the term theurgy as, as, as a route for, for personal tra transformation. Um, ha have you experienced any personal transformation, uh, changes within the psyche, permanent changes that you're noticing when you're studying yourself since getting into this stuff? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, it, I don't know what is coming from what, whether it's just like being more aware of, you know, doing so much inner work and being more aware of, you know, my shadow or things that I need to work on it myself or, you know, um, but I think the the times when I took my practice very seriously, um, I was awarded realizations about 
the world, my world, my existence, how I perceive the world, how I am a part of it. And um, I was awarded these, these realizations, um, but they were humbling, you know, kind of being able to, okay, how do I explain this in words? Hmm. <laughs> being able to recognize how minuscule each human being is and how there by just in my opinion it's pure chance that any of this happened as it did and i got this body at this moment whatever and so instead of thinking of life as this curse which i used to think of i'm thinking it more of as wow how ridiculous this is such a funny world yeah all of the sense and sights and all of the weird little things and you know but but the more I consider myself as like a human, a big, big human, like, you know, like I'm a man or whatever, the more I feel disconnected from uh, a, an inner truth that I feel like I was awarded through these practices. So the closer I am, that's why I, I enjoy living in the woods because it brings me right down to the earth. And it reminds me that I am no different than the ant that's right over there or, you know, the the woodpecker outside or anything like we're all the same it's just like diff we're different forms and um and that makes me just appreciate life more yeah for sure and, and you feel like the the move like into nature has caused sort of further reflection and further connection to to the web of life to the divinity and everything yeah i think because when i'm when i'm in cities and i'm around people i'm um i'm, I'm picking up all of their their situations, you know, like yeah. they're all, it's all like work and, and life and there's marriage and there's stuff and there's restaurants and, you know, there's a taxi and stuff. And you're just kind of like so deeply embedded in that world. That's earth. Earth is a city. Like, and then when I live, when I'm in the woods, I'm like, oh, right. This, this makes more sense to me. Like, I don't think I, like, I, I feel like this makes this is more the vibe. So there's just like, there's just like trees out there, but yeah. <laughs> but like, it just makes more sense to me. I feel more at ease. I'm more like, I can, I can kind of like tune into my own sort of situation instead of feeling like claustrophobic all the time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting going back to, to what you were saying earlier about, you know, uh, originally being, ha having a darker outlook on, on, on this world. Right. And then actually having a more positive outlook by just uh, viewing the smallness of humans uh, in some ways, you know, and this is this is my read and you didn't say this, but it, it's just how delicate we are too. like there, there's a sort of sacredness and holiness to this to this realization of, of being in this bizarre world that we're not supposed to be in, right? Whether, you know, whether you're a materialist, atheist, or, or a Gnostic, right? There yeah. is this appreciation of, this was all an accident, and I'm not supposed to be here, right? That's what both Gnostics and, and atheists say. But there's almost a, um, a gnosis of, of a sense of humor, right? Where, of course, the statement... Uh, we're trapped in an imperfect world created by an imperfect God, uh, on one hand, can and should cause existential dread. But on the other hand, there's, it's funny. Like, you know, there's, there's a sense of levity to it. Yeah. yeah. And it's kind of like, I feel very grateful to be, you know, to be a human, to be a human in this time period. Like we're awarded a lot of creature comforts. I'm, you know, I can get very cozy, you know, Coziness is very easy as a human these days. It's awesome, you know, but, uh, and, and that's cool. But like at the same time, the more I consider, the more I participate, and this is something I've, I've realized and have dealt with my whole life, but the more I try to participate in like the human game, the more disappointed I am in my life. The more I lean into the rhythms and the cycles of that the earth provides me, the more I feel relaxed and easeful and the more I enjoy being alive. So <laughs> on a practical level, it just makes more sense to me to just do the thing that feels more enjoyable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I, I wonder, um, something that really fascinates me is saying to someone, you're a sensitive person. 
is an insult in our culture, right? That that has negative connotations. When of course being sensitive is is being open to all of these things. It's it's a good thing. You know, it's it's a full spectrum emotional awareness as well as which uh, uh, it sounds like it can also be a problem, you know, this dissolving of boundaries, like what you're talking about being in cities, right? When you're highly yeah. sensitive, you don't have, you know, that boundary that, that other people have. So you absorb so much off of them, but it, but it's also a blessing, right? Yeah. It's mostly a blessing in my opinion, you know, it's, it's hard to deal with to be sensitive in um, our, our effed up society. And as I said, being told so is an insult, but uh, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, it is definitely a blessing. I hope so. I thought it would, because it feels wrong, right? It feels yeah. like it shouldn't, I always thought that I was like exhausted because I just wasn't, I couldn't, I wasn't up to snuff. Like I couldn't handle it. I couldn't take it, you know? Yeah. But then, you know, be, uh, being sensitive in, in the natural world is awesome because when you're sensitive in nature, you're able to kind of hear earth speak to you but when you're sensitive in a city it just is like screaming it's like <laughs> it's very it's very like uh, yeah it's caustic so um just learning that i guess learning that about myself was really important that there are some things that um that i just need to not be around all the time yeah, precisely. Well, unfortunately, we are getting into the home stretch. Uh, I'd keep you all night if it was possible, but I, I should uh, let you go so that you can live your awesome life. <laughs> and so uh, a, a final final question is, is, what's your favorite Gnostic influence piece of, of art or media? Wow, that's a good question. Because I'm not, I'm never always sure what is and isn't Gnostic. Well, yeah, that makes that makes you and everybody's interested in Gnosticism. <laughs> I will say, I yeah. will say that um, it's it, it it was just very funny to me that I when I was like eighteen and nineteen I became obsessed with Philip K. Dick and read all of his like almost all of the books, yeah. and um, then discovered exegesis. But I was too young to know what Gnosticism was, and then ten years later, going wait, this, like, he basically wrote a modern gospel, yeah. and this is my bro, like, this is my homie, like, this, I visited his grave, like, oh, wow. <laughs> like, I was, uh, I'm obsessed with him, like, and, um, and, and, and so to think of that, like, wow, he really, I don't know if he did that to me, or if we just found the same things, like, maybe, maybe a little bit of both, but, um, I would say that PKD really, uh, and but in terms of the best work, I mean, I guess like the Valos trilogy is pretty Gnostic, so I would say that. But my favorite book of his is actually Ubik. Uh, yeah. I find that one really special. But yeah. Yeah, me too. That that's one I I keep coming back to. Um, and uh, it's very Gnostic, right? You know, they're they're trapped in layers of false realities. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah okay. It's uh, it's it's not as perhaps explicitly Gnostic as Valos, but of course few works are besides actual Gnostic gospels. So, right. <laughs> which of course it is. Um, but yeah, again, uh, you, I, I, I suspect many others have had this experience of, of being a huge uh, PKD uh, fan in our younger years and coming back to it later as, as the Gnosis calls us. And yeah, like it's, it's probably a combination of both. Uh, he both set us up for it, and also we were already, you know, attuned to to the doses, right? So uh, a bit from column A, a bit from column B. Uh, Nika, thanks so much. Uh, before we depart, uh, on, on a little podcast asking, you know, one of our greatest living musicians if she has any plugs. But do you, do you have any plugs? Anything you want to tell the people about and where they can find you and such? Uh, well, I have my own Patreon because we are living in that world. Uh, Patreon.com slash Jesus. If you want to support me being um, very sensitive out here in the woods, escaping the world. Um, but yeah, other than that, the, just Sola Jesus wherever you go. Hopefully it's me. Um, and thank you. I, I so appreciate it. I really appreciate being able to uh, have conversations with people about th this, this, these types of things, these kinds of things. I think it's... It's very rewarding for me, so thank you. 
Yeah, so it, it's been really thrilling for me, and, and I know that all the Gnostic elite out there who are watching and listening to this, they, they will also find it as thrilling. Uh, before we go, I'll very quickly do my plugs, which is myelandmeditation.substack.com. I'm doing some training to do secular mindfulness. It's not specifically Gnostic meditation. It's uh, mindfulness meditation, but of course, it's also good if you're a Gnostic or a spiritual person. So uh, I'm in Montreal. We're pretty locked down right now, so I'm doing it online. So feel free to come out. It's 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Montreal time. It's free and it's a mix of guided and silent meditation. And uh, we've got a good crew that comes out. And also because of the lockdown, um, I I don't have the banner set up, but uh, holygrail.substack.com, <laughs> which is uh, my parish in Montreal. Again, we're normally meeting in person, but we're doing some online events. So feel free to check us out there. We normally do pretty meditation based uh, stuff, particularly online where you know we have less less options okay that's it uh again thank you so much uh nika zola jesus it's been uh it's been amazing thank you very much